Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our second evening and final evening of our uh, vicariate retreat. Um, let's begin by saying another Hail Mary tonight. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last night, Matthew Leonard was here and spoke to us, uh, shared with us on the subject of divine destiny and how the public secret of Catholicism changes everything. Well, tonight he's going to expand on these thoughts as he shares with us the three stages of deeper prayer. Please join me in welcoming back to the pulpit best-selling author and speaker, Matthew Leonard. All right. Good evening, everybody. You guys hear me all right in the back? Yeah? The good Catholics in the back? I got it. That's where I sit, too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so last night, um, I hope I succeeded in opening your eyes a bit to the fact that Catholicism is the pearl of great price, that we really can't even fathom what it is that God has given to us and how grateful we should be as Catholics because we've got it all going on. Tonight, I want to dive in a little bit more into, as Mike was saying, the three stages of prayer, because this is one of the major ways that we make this divine destiny that I was talking about a reality in our lives. And to be perfectly honest, if more Catholics had a real life of prayer, we wouldn't be facing a lot of the problems we do inside and outside of the, of the faith, right? We have to develop this relationship with them. The Catechism says that prayer restores man to God's likeness and enables him to share in the power of God's love. So Father Jay, the homily yesterday, was talking about how we're supposed to be made in the image and likeness of God. We're all made in the image of God, for sure. Adam and Eve were made in the image of likeness. They lost that likeness through sin. We need to get that likeness back. That's what the Catholic life is really all about. And prayer is one of the major ways in which we do this, according to the Catechism. And it's something that we desperately need. I mean, what if Mike and I were walking down the street and we saw a stranger coming towards us? And I turned to Mike and I said, hey, why don't you go ask that guy to help you with some issue with your kids or maybe to help you clean your garage or a problem you're having at work? Mike would turn to me and say, take a hike, man. I don't even know that guy. That's exactly right. And yet we tend to do this with God all the time. Like we're only talking to him when we need something. We need to develop a relationship with him. And when you think about it, if you don't pray, it's crazy. Because if you're not praying, you're not talking to the person who loves you more than anybody else does. Right? Prayer is where we make our lives, our needs, our interior life known to Almighty God so that we can make it through this world in one piece. Just kind of lay it out for the Lord. We grow in likeness and we become like him in prayer. Right? So what exactly is it? Well, if you've ever read the Catechism, you know that there are four sections of it, right? The last section is all on prayer. The church knows if you don't have a life of prayer, all things being equal, you're just not going to make it to heaven. Why? Because prayer is your relationship with God, and you have to have that when you, when you meet him, right? He's going to ask you at your final judgment, at your personal judgment, like, do I know you? Well, you get to know him through prayer. So, if you go through the Catechism and list a bunch of different forms of prayer. Blessing, petition, adoration, thanksgiving, intercession, praise. Why so many different kinds of prayer? Because the way we talk to God changes depending upon the situation we're in, right? If you're on a safari in Africa and you fall into quicksand and all of a sudden you're up to your neck in it and you're sinking fast, you're not praying for a raise at work, right? You're like, God, save me! Help me! And then once he does, you're thanking and praising him for the deliverance that he's given you. So prayer changes depending upon the situation that we're in. Now, St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, says that for her, prayer is a surge of the heart. It's a simple look turned toward heaven. 
a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. And that's an important part, the last part of that quote, embracing trials and joy. We're really good at praying when things aren't going well. Like the blue lights are flashing in the rear view. Oh, God, help me, right? I swear I'll never do it again. But when things are sailing along, we kind of forget about that relationship with the Lord. But it it's, should encompass all of our lives. But really, prayer is where we encounter Jesus Christ and realize that Jesus is seeking us. The Catechism says that prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts for you. That's why he made you, to be in relationship with him. He really desires us more than we do. And prayer comes from the heart. And that's where all of our prayers should come from. It's the movement of, of our heart to God. But it comes from that place deep down inside of us. You know that conversation we have when we're alone with ourselves, our interior life? We don't think about it very often. But every one of us has that interior life, that little conversation you have. You're like, you know... I want this, I want that. My minivan's cooler than hers, you know? My boots are better than his. You think no one can hear you, but God does. Right? And all too often, the conversation inside of our heads revolves around one thing, us. You know, I was in the, the Lule's kitchen yesterday and, and they had a newspaper. Like, when was the last time I saw a newspaper, right? But the comics were on the top. What if... Every one of us, as we walked around, had our thoughts over the top of our head like the comic strip bubbles you used to read in the Sunday paper. That wouldn't be very good, would it? It would expose the fact that we are so consumed with ourselves. Everything revolves around me, me, me. Prayer is what changes all that. Prayer is what moves us outward and upward. Our gaze is transformed. It goes out and up. It's elevated to Almighty God. Realize, too, the, the power of prayer in conjunction with the sacraments. It's a one-two punch in Catholicism, guys. When Father raises the host, when we celebrate Mass, realize there is enough grace in that consecrated host to save the entire world. It's the fullness of God. The only thing stopping it is us. Prayer is what gets us out of the way so that the grace of the sacraments can have its maximum impact on us so that we can be transformed, so we can get out of ourselves and our own self-centered world and offer ourselves along with Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world in the Mass. That's the power of prayer. So prayer changes our focus. So under, under the influence of grace, that, that self-centered conversation becomes a God-centered conversation. And that's what we have to do. But I think a lot of us have a warped view of prayer because we just don't really understand its power. Like we do it, even if you do it regularly, it's so easy to fall into the habit. And I'm guilty of this. It's easy to fall into the habit of something you just kind of tick off of your spiritual to-do list. Yep, I did it, I did it, I did it. Right? Even if you do it regularly. Or maybe you just do it because you're told to, but it's just kind of this boring exercise for us. We don't understand that we are literally made to pray. We are made to be in relationship with Almighty God. And just like our human relationships need care and attention so as to grow, so too does our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And I think this can be an issue for a lot of Catholics. Why? Well, because we know lots of different prayers, right? But maybe we haven't had a conversion of heart which would transform the way that we pray. Now, I shudder to think, how many times have I droned through an Our Father at Mass without really thinking about what it is that I'm saying? How many rosaries have I said where I'm not really meditating on the mysteries? You know, all too often, our memorares, our rosaries, our litanies, and these kinds of things, they become mechanical. And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these kinds of prayer aren't good. They're great. You have no idea how happy I am that we have these gorgeous prayers in Catholicism. Uh, because as a pastor's kid, you know, you always had to come up with your stuff on the fly. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure. In fact, one of the things that I've noticed in my almost 25 years as a Catholic, uh, the Lule house excluded because they, they, they actually do a lot of praying over there. It was awesome. But most of the time when you go to a Catholic's house for dinner and you get asked to pray, you know what that means? 
you're the first person to cross yourself and start the bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts prayer, right? There's no pressure. None. When you're a Protestant, especially as a pastor's kid, and you get asked to pray, it was showtime, right? You had to whip out your best stuff, and you got to impress them with your relationship with God. What happens is you end up saying the same stuff over and over and over again. Father God this, Father God that, thank you for this, thank you for that, bless us food, you know, let's eat. I'll never forget, it was probably about three years after I became Catholic. I had one child at the time, a little girl, and I invited my brother-in-law and my sister over for dinner. And in a kind of a show of ecumenism, I invited my brother-in-law to pray over the meal. And he is a pastor. In fact, now he's like the equivalent of a bishop in his denomination. And he can pray beautifully. And he launched into this prayer. Well, my two-year-old has never heard anything like this before. She's used to the bless us, O Lord, and she's like, what's going on? And about 45 seconds into this prayer, he took a breath and she said, Amen. <laughs> that was that. <laughs> we went to dinner. <laughs> but as Catholics, we have these beautiful set prayers that we can fall back on, right? It's awesome. Even Jesus. Jesus was a good Jew. He learned all the prayers of his day. But what he shows us is that his prayer to the Father is just that. It's the prayer of a son to a father. Well, guess what? You and I, as we talked about last night, we're members of that mystical body of Christ. We have the opportunity to approach God the exact same way. We can call him Daddy. And, and he's waiting for us to come to him. Waiting. And we enter into that relationship with him through prayer. So, what exactly is it? Right? Now, I cannot hope to cover all the aspects of prayer in one talk. Don't forget, there are books back in the back that are free for you guys to take on this topic. But what I want to do uh, for the rest of this short talk is to, if you've never entered into a life of prayer, kick you off. Like, get going tonight. If you have one, I want to encourage you to go deeper, all right? Now, in addition to the different forms of prayer that I mentioned that are in the catechism, blessing, petition, adoration, thanksgiving, etc., there are three major modes of prayer that are universal to all Catholics. Vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. And they form a kind of a framework in which the forms of prayer operate. Okay? And vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer are also a kind of a ladder that you climb as you move toward God, as you move into deeper communion with him. Because prayer has a goal. The goal is God. The goal is perfection, and perfection takes time. So there are stages in the process as you move through prayer. So prayer is this kind of ladder that you climb as you move toward God. And as you ascend toward God in your prayer life, the way that you pray changes as your relationship with him matures. Okay? So it's like a couple who's been married. This is the analogy I always use. It's like a couple who's been married for a long, long time. You guys remember way back in the day when you first started dating your spouse or whatever relationship you had, you remember you'd talk about everything? I mean, everything was this massive conversation, and you wanted to talk to her, she wanted to talk to you, and why? Because you want the, they want each other to get to know each other, right? You want to bear yourself to them so that they get to know you. And then, as time goes by, your mode of communication begins to change, right? Because your relationship has deepened and matured. You don't have to talk all the time in order to communicate. For a couple who's been married, you know, 20 plus years, if the guy grunts and holds his hand out, that means, can you bring me a beer, right? And when the wife rolls her eyes and goes, give me a break, right, under her breath, that means get up and get it yourself. You've been sitting on the couch watching football all day. Why don't you mow the lawn while you're at it? Not a word was spoken, right? It's like that old Keith Whitley song, you say it best when you say nothing at all. And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the longer you're married, the less you should talk. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, gentlemen, I don't want any emails, okay? But like, guys, you know this. Maybe you found yourself at a party at some point, and you're off in the corner, and you're talking with your buddies. Maybe you're talking about something you shouldn't, right? And you kind of look around, and you catch your wife's eye from across the room, and she's got the raised eyebrow. You're like, how did she hear, right? How does she know what it is that I'm even talking about? Or maybe it's just like a little playful smirk or a hand gesture or you just look into the eyes of the other person 
and you know exactly what it is that they're thinking. It doesn't have to be married couples. Deep friendships have the same kind of thing. You know exactly what the other person is thinking. Why? Well, because your relationship is deepened. You spent so much time together through the years that you know them inside and out, and they know you. You're in deeper union with them. It's the same thing in our relationship with Almighty God, all right? You continue to engage in, in the different types and the stages of prayer, but the way you do it changes as your relationship deepens, okay? So let's talk in more concrete terms about these three different stages. And number one is vocal prayer. And you guys all know this, right? We've been praying vocal prayers for a long time. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Psalm 51, 15. You've been praying Hail Mary since you were knee-high to a grasshopper. Uh, Jesus himself taught us the Our Father, the most famous vocal prayer. And think about that. God is teaching us to pray to God. The Our Father is super important. In fact, St. Teresa of Avila says that she knew nuns who achieved a huge, like they went way up the ladder of spirituality just by meditating on the Our Father. Right, so it's a powerful prayer. The vocal prayer is really important for us as Catholics. Why? Well, because we are a union of body and soul, of body and spirit. We're not pure spirits floating around like angels. We're a union of body and soul. And so we have a need to make our interior life known exteriorly. My father-in-law is a die-hard Dallas Cowboys fan. If it's third and 17 and they run up the middle on a line plunge of some kind, he's screaming at the TV. You know, uses more like anemic and, you know, morons and whatever. Why? Because he's taking this interior anger and he's making it known exteriorly. I'm like, dude, take a pill, right? But we do this in the liturgy too. Wait, we fold our hands when we pray. We bow. Right? We lift our hands. We genuflect in front of a tabernacle. Why? Because we're showing this interior reverence we have exteriorly. Vocal prayer falls along the same lines. Right? It makes our interior life known. It expresses our, in, our inner life. So it's really important. You never leave vocal prayer behind even as you ascend the ladder toward God. The Catechism says it's an essential element of the Christian life. Because words, guys, words are powerful. Words are really powerful. God created the world with just a few words. You know, let there be. You're like, well, I don't have that kind of power. You're right. We don't have that kind of creative power. But we do know from our own experience how powerful words are. You've probably cut some, someone to shreds with your words at some point. Or maybe you've been cut to shreds by somebody else's words. Two little words, you know, I do change everything, right? So words are powerful. And, and also, words are powerful, and vocal prayer is powerful and necessary because, again, we're the family of God, and so we come together to worship the Lord. We need language in order to come together and have our family celebration at the altar. Okay, so vocal prayer is something we do all the way through our Catholic lives. However, you will notice that the more time you spend alone with God, your personal prayer life will tend to change and evolve, as we're going to see. Now, something to remember with vocal prayer. St. John Chrysostom says that whether or not our prayer is heard depends not on the number of words, but upon the fervor of our souls. Those are strong words, right? Um, what is he, what's he saying? Basically, when you pray, you got to think about what you're saying. My kids, we have about time for one decade as I drive them to school every day. And sometimes I can tell they are zoning out. And sometimes I do too, but I'm like, what mystery are we on? You know, just to kind of bring them back in. If you're not thinking about what it is you're praying, you're, you're pretty much not praying, all right? St. Francis de Sales and St. Teresa of Avila say that one fervent Our Father, one fervent Hail Mary is far more powerful than a slew of rosaries you just kind of blow through. Jesus said, don't babble like the pagans. And in fact, when you really become tuned into your vocal prayer and you're focusing on it, it slowly becomes meditation. So let's move to this second stage of prayer. And for my money, this is probably the most important part of this talk. And the reason why is that most Catholics don't have a life of meditative prayer. And we need to develop one. 
what is Catholic meditative prayer? Because it's not rocket science, and there's so much confusion out there about this. Basically, meditation is just attentive reflection on God that's aided by some kind of a physical input. That's all it is. Attentive reflection on God aided by some kind of a physical input. It's a quiet prayer. Generally speaking, no words are spoken. Okay? It's an interior prayer. And it's so important that St. Alphonsus Liguori, kind of paraphrasing Teresa of Avila, says that if you don't have a regular life of meditative prayer, meaning daily, you don't need demons to carry you to hell. You carry yourself there in your own hands. Now, St. Teresa herself says that meditation is the basis for acquiring all the virtues, and the practice of it, to, uh, to undertake it, is a matter of life and death for all Christians. And you're like, why? Why is it that important? Because the catechism says, this is the quest for God. This is where the mind seeks to adhere and respond to what the Lord is asking, right? So you want to know what God wants you to do in your life? You've got to be in relationship with him. You have to have this life of meditative prayer. So meditation is where we ponder the mysteries of Christ so that he speaks to us in various ways and our relationship with him grows. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It doesn't mean you're thinking about him passively, right? And that you, or that you kind of lose yourself into the essence or, or whatever. That is not Catholic teaching. I don't remember if I mentioned this or not last night, but in prayer, you know, you stay you, I stay me, and we are joined to God, right? We participate in God, but we don't lose our identity, and we're not trying to empty our minds. That is Eastern religions, not Eastern Catholic, that's Eastern religions, that's not Catholic teaching. In fact, it's like, it's silly when you think about it. I don't want to empty myself of God. I don't want to empty my mind of God. I want to fill up with Almighty God. This is what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And this meditative conversation we have is just that. It's a conversation. It's a back and forth. It's meant to be interactive. It is not a one-way street. We ponder the mysteries of Christ. This starts this interior dialogue between us and him. So we become intimate with our Lord. We allow him to seep into our very being, so to speak, in meditative prayer. And you don't just chat. You know, like, how you doing, God? Prayer is always meant to change our lives. It's, it's always ordered to action. We're becoming more like Jesus in this. So we have to resolve to actually take some, some action based on what it is the Lord shows us. So, how do we do it? What does meditative prayer actually look like? And first of all, let me just point this out. It doesn't matter what kind of meditative prayer you're doing, whether it's Marian or, you know, Divine Mercy or whatever kind of meditation you might be doing. Everything always comes back to Jesus Christ. St. Maximilian Kolbe said that all of our prayers, all of our devotions, doesn't matter what you do, they're all links in a chain that go back to one place, Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the word made flesh. He is God become man. So we focus on the mysteries of his life so that we become more like him. All right? That's what it's all about. Now, let's do a thumbnail sketch of how you do meditative prayer, right? So that you can start doing this tonight, if you haven't already. Glorified common sense to start out, number one. Quiet place and a good time, right? St. Gregory of Nazianza said, we must remember God more often than we draw breath. St. Paul says, pray constantly in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. St. Paul doesn't mean you're kind of muttering prayers to yourself in the produce section over a Safeway and people are like, man, what a freak. I'm not going by that guy. That's not what he means. What he means is we're supposed to live in a state of prayer. Because if prayer is our relationship with God, why wouldn't we be living in a state of prayer? There's never supposed to be a time when you're out of relationship with God. And the, the visual that I kind of use with this is like, it's like glowing embers in your soul, right? That's your state of prayer. And then when you enter into an act of prayer, like you're praying a rosary or something, it's like the breath of the Holy Spirit comes in and blows across those coals and ignites a flame of love in your heart. 
but you can't get there. You can't have those embers burning, so to speak, constantly until you set aside very specific, set regular times to enter into meditative prayer with our Lord. You have to. Because, like, you all know that if you don't make prayer non-negotiable on your, on your to-do list, it'll be the first thing that gets kicked off of your to-do list when things get busy. And when was the last time that you had a non-busy day? Right? Because we're all a little ADD, right, when it comes to prayer. We've got to set this time and we have to do it all the time. It's got to be a quiet place and a workable time. Bowling alleys don't work. They don't work. Wedding showers don't work. Don't even try, okay? We have to be able to focus in. We need silence. Jesus would get up in the wee hours of the morning or he'd stay up all night long. The second person the most holy trinity needed silence. We need silence as well. So we have to set the stage. Again, because we're a union of body and soul. So we have to set the appropriate exterior stage for us to be able to enter into this conversation with God. You know, adoration chapels are the best. If you've got access to one somewhere, that's the best place to do it. But you can do this in your living room. You know, most of the time, that's what I'm doing. I'm in a certain spot. I go to the same place all the time in my living room. It's like my prayer corner. And my body knows, like, okay, I'm, I'm dialing in for prayer, right? Now, as, as far as length of time, how long do you do this? First of all, it depends partly on your state in life. Okay, if you got, you know, a house full of kids and it's crazy and you're hanging on by a thread because you're exhausted all the time, your prayer time is going to look different than, you know, later stages in life. It just will, right? But generally speaking, if you've never done it before, I always say you eat the elephant one bite at a time. You set aside 10 to 15 minutes to begin with. And you're like, well, that's not bad, right? I will tell you right now, it's the longest 10 to 15 minutes of your life when you first start doing it. Because it, it's so hard for us to quiet ourselves down and put ourselves in the moment. I, I was in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and baby turtles hatched. And we literally stood there for 45 minutes watching them move 10 feet to the beach. That's like meditative prayer when you first start. Like, I'm never going to get that time back, right? They probably got eaten by sharks as soon as they got in the water, which is what they told us. I'm like, really? My kids just like fell in love with these turtles. Now they're going to get eaten. Why'd you tell us that? But that's what meditative prayer is, like watching paint dry. It's really hard for us to do this because of our fallen nature, right? We're trying to get over these hurdles that were, have been plaguing us since the Garden of Eden. But you do it, and I will tell you this. After you continue to set this 10 to 15 minutes aside, after a little while, all of a sudden that 10 to 15 becomes 15 to 20. It becomes 25 to 30, it becomes an hour, and it's whipping by. I did not believe that when I first read it. I'm like, no way. But it is true. And you know why? Because literally, this is what we are made for. We are made to be in this prayer relationship with God. So the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Okay? Quiet time and place. Number two, recollection. What is recollection? It means putting yourself in the moment interiorly. So we set the exterior stage. Quiet place. Good time. Now we got to quiet down interiorly. And for beginners especially, and this goes on for a long time, this is oftentimes the hardest part of meditative prayer. Because you got to check your concerns at the door and put yourself in the presence of God. One of the easiest practical ways to do this is just to repeat the name of Jesus over and over and over. Or take a Bible and slowly start to read through the Passion. And the goal is to put yourself in the moment. The saints say... That all things being equal, the best time to do this is early in the morning, before you do anything else, because you're not distracted yet by the things of the day. So this is what I do. The only time I can find any peace and quiet in my house with six kids is if I'm up earlier than everybody else. So I make my coffee, I don't turn my phone on, and I go to this, the, the chair, my prayer chair, and that's my quiet time. And you know what? Sometimes I get interrupted. A kid wakes up early. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Right? It's not Saturday morning. You're not supposed to be up early. You know? like, and if you get interrupted, fine. Like, that's what happens. Life intervenes. Your prayer life is dependent upon your vocation in life and your state in life. Okay? So always remember that. But 
Recollection is really hard. And if I remember this in the Q&A, somebody remind me. There's a kind of ripple effect of recollection that has a big, a big impact on your life. I don't want to pause and talk about that right now because I want to make sure I get to the major stuff. But somebody remind me of the ripple effect of recollection, okay? So exterior stage is set. Interior stage is set. You're quiet. You're quiet. Now comes the actual meditation. And again, it's attentive reflection on our Lord aided by some kind of a physical input. Why do we use physical stuff to pray? Because I didn't do that growing up. You know, as a Protestant, our gig was getting everything out of the way. It was just me and Jesus. But we use physical images or beads and books and beauty and smells and bells. Why? Because as human beings with five God-given senses, this is how we relate to him. Why do we build churches with high ceilings? Because you come in and your heart is lifted to God. Why do we want beautiful things? Because God is truth, beauty, and goodness. It draws us to him. We relate to God through the physical universe. It's one of the greatest things about being Catholic. Right? So we use these things to get to him. Now, most of the time, we use books. Right? That's what you use to meditate. So let's use that as an example. You got your Bible. You got your saint book or you know, whatever it is, your Magnificat. And you start to slowly read through it. And I mean slowly. You've got to soak in this, right? It's not a race. The spiritual life is a marathon, not a sprint. So you've got to take your time. It's about quality, not quantity. And because uh, what's the goal? What's the goal of prayer? The goal of prayer isn't to finish. The goal of prayer is God, right? You want relationship with him. So you're reading slowly something pops off the page at you pause engage the lord in conversation about it talk to him about it and then once you're distracted or you know uh, the moment is over go back to your reading continue on slowly but also realize when god begins to speak to you in this you have to resolve to actually do what it is he's saying because remember prayer is about action it's about transformation Maybe he shows you there's somebody in your life you need to forgive. Maybe he shows you some vice or some virtue that you need to work on. Whatever it is, you pray for the grace to be able to do what it is that he wants so that your life is transformed because it's all about becoming like Jesus Christ. So we have to resolve to act on what it is that he shows us because meditation is not just intellectual study. You're not prepping for some exam. Right? This is relationship with God. Also, this is really hard for a lot of people. Allow the conversation to go the way the Lord directs it. Okay, because all too often we fall into this habit of just doing the exact same thing over and over. You don't always have to do the same thing over and over. In fact, what's going to happen is, the, as you enter into the life of meditative prayer, and you've been doing it for a while, you're going to come to a point in time when you're going to start to feel this little nudge to kind of put the book down or the Magnificat, whatever it is you're dealing with, and just kind of be with God. And this is, all things being equal, a sign that you are being prepared to move into contemplation, the third and the highest form of prayer. So let's talk about this third stage of prayer. And the first thing to say about contemplation is this. Even though it's its own category of prayer, it is very difficult to describe. And the reason why is that it is supernatural in origin. Okay? Um, in vocal prayer and meditative prayer, we're the ones doing it, right? We're reading, we're meditating, we're reflecting. We are the ones doing the action. Contemplation is all God. He is the cause and the origin. Right? We have a role. Our role is to prepare for it. And we prepare through meditation. We prepare through living the life of virtue. But it's all God. It's what we call an infused prayer. It comes from the Latin word infusum. So infusum means that which is poured in. So in contemplation, God begins to literally pour himself into you. And what you receive in this pouring in is what we were talking about last night. The indwelling of Almighty God, the, your participation in the divine nature of God. And it's almost, you know, maybe you shouldn't even talk about it in those terms because at your baptism, you already have the Trinity dwelling inside of you. It's more like the activation of the Trinitarian life inside of you. God is filling you up from the inside out. 
That's what happens in contemplative prayer. You can't do that on your own. Right? We need help to become divinized, and that's what we get in this final stage of prayer. In many ways, contemplative prayer is the highest stage. It's the, con it's the consummation of your spiritual life. This is what it's all about. Okay, so what more can we say about it? Number one, it's for you. It's for you. Every single person in this church is made to enter into contemplative prayer with Almighty God. This is not something that's reserved for saints and holy people. This is how people become saints. You want your mug on a holy card? This is how you do it. And you should want your mug on a holy card because that's the goal at the end of the day. The only people in heaven are saints, right? This is how you get there. God wants to pour himself inside of you. It does not matter your state in life. It's not just something for monks and nuns living in the hinterland with hair shirts on. It is for you. It's Joe and Judy six-pack, all right? But also realize it takes time. It takes time for this to happen. You cannot jump in and out of contemplative prayer. And I know there's a lot of confusion out there about this, and you hear some people teaching that you can kind of center down or you can chant some mantra and you're going to end up in contemplation. It doesn't work that way, and that flies in the face of 2,000 years of Catholic teaching, okay? But the question remi remains, what is it? Right? And it's, this is a tough question to answer. There are some spiritual authors that will boil it down to this. They'll say that contemplation is the us beginning to glimpse heaven. We're starting to see the end goal. God is beginning to join himself to us in a powerful way. Maybe you've read this in books sometimes, like when we're in heaven, we'll have the full vision of God in the beatific vision, right? Well, contemplation is the beginning of that vision of God Almighty. And St. Teresa of Avila, she uses these kind of vague terms when she talks about it. She says it's like a close sharing between friends, or she says... It's the warmth of God. St. John of the Cross calls it the fragrance of God. And you're like, well, come on, give me something a little better than that, right? That's not really telling me what contemplation is. But they use these kinds of phrases and words because contemplation isn't emotion. It's not feelings. It might overflow into a sensory experience where you really feel, the, feel God in a palpable way. But none of that stuff is intrinsic to it. It's really difficult to describe because what's happening is God is beginning to literally take a hold of your soul in contemplation. You enter into a new relationship with him that goes beyond what words can say. That's why the saints can't describe it. We literally don't have the vocabulary to describe how God is taking hold of your soul. He's got you in a tractor beam and he's drawing you to himself and they can't describe it. Because it's not of this world. It's otherworldly. You're being joined to the divine. Remember Peter, James, and John when they go up Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration? St. Luke says Jesus shone like the sun in this theophany. And the disciples are so overcome by this experience, Peter's like, I'm going to build three tents. We can hang out here for a while. And he was like crazy, right? St. Luke says he was literally out of his mind. He didn't know what he was saying because he had just seen the veil of heaven pulled back ever so slightly and he had a view of God. God had dazzled them with his divinity, and he was outside of himself. It was almost like he couldn't handle it. That's contemplation. We're being prepared for eternity. The human is becoming divine. It's the final plank in that ladder to heaven. That's what it's all about, God. It, uh, guys, it's, it's crazy powerful because you're not just seeing God. You're literally becoming like him. That's what's happening in contemplation. That's why they can't describe it. And the more you experience God in this manner, you start to understand why the psalmist cries out, yea, my soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. That's contemplation. Now, practically speaking, how this happens is what I was describing earlier. You get to this place in your life of meditative prayer where you begin to have these little nudges to kind of put the book down and just be with our Lord. St. Teresa of Avila calls this the prayer of simple gaze. You just want to be with him, right? And in the beginning, these little nudges are really short. They're literally just, just kind of like little nudges that you feel. And you got to be tuned into this. you got to know what's coming. Because all too often, people just kind of ignore these and they squash them. And they, they, they just keep going and doing what it is they're doing. 
And you can understand why, because we fall into this habit of being used to dictate our relationship with God. Right? Because in meditative prayer, it's really easy to see the direct correspondence between what we do and what we get. I put in a little time of meditative prayer, pull the, the lever, and I get my grace out the other side. I get my spiritual growth, right? We are the ones that are in charge. But and when God grants a soul loving, passive contemplation, he takes over. And while it's this incredible experience, lots of times you'll feel an anxiety because you're not doing anything anymore. You're just being with God, and you're like, wait a minute, am I backsliding? Aren't I supposed to be doing something? Because we're so geared this way. God's like, no, be quiet, sit down, hush. I'm filling you up with myself. And we just have to receive at this point. And that's hard for us to do because before we knew what we were doing, but now God is drawing us gently to himself. And even though you might experience a kind of an anxiety, you also know something special is taking place, right? Because he's intensifying his relationship with you. But you also know the intensity comes and goes, right? Because now you've gotten to this maturation level in your spiritual life where your spiritual life isn't based on emotions. You cannot do that. Don't fall into that trap, ever. Prayer is not about what you feel or you don't feel. You're going to feel sometimes really good in prayer. Sometimes you, ca- you come to dryness. Like tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk to the men's group about the three stages of the spiritual life. Dryness, lots of times, is an indicator that God is working more deeply on you. It's not that you're doing something wrong. You just haven't developed the senses to see that he's actually gotten closer to you. So you don't feel him anymore the way you used to, and stuff gets dry. You're like, wait a minute, God, where'd you go? Like, we had something going on here, and now you're dis- you've disappeared. It's not that he goes further away. He's gotten closer to you, but you can't sense him yet. Okay? So your spiritual life is never based on your emotions. Emotions come and go faster than the taste of, like, fruit-striped gum, guys. Remember that? You chew it in, like, three seconds, the taste was gone. That's what it's like in the spiritual life. Don't base your spirituality on this. That's a trap a lot of people falling into. But God intensifies the relationship. Sometimes you'll feel powerfully the presence of God. Sometimes you won't. In fact, think about the, the transfiguration story. Because even though the disciples are up on Mount Tabor and they have this divine experience with Almighty God, what happens at the end of the story? they got to come back down the mountain. They have to rejoin the world. They have to go through the same duties of life that they had previously. Although now, they're living at a totally different level of life. Right? They've reached a different plateau in the spiritual life. And so everything they do is different because they've been kissed by God. Their soul has been immersed in the divine love of Almighty God. That's what happens to us. We continue to go through the duties and the state of life and all of our chores and such, but we do it in a different way because we've moved into a new dimension of relationship with God that nothing can even really describe. And if you're kind of sitting there thinking, man, I have never heard some of this stuff before, and maybe I need to get into this, and I hope that's what you feel. Let me share some words of St. Teresa of Avila she has for beginners. She says, All the beginner in prayer has to do is to labor and be resolute and prepare himself with all possible diligence to bring his will into conformity with the will of God. In other words, again, prayer isn't just chatting. Prayer is designed for us to join our will to God. That's the definition of perfection right there. You want to know what it's all about? Our will conforming to God's will. That's what prayer does. And I know, like these days, it can be like, how in the world are we going to do that? Right? Because the world at times these days is like a boiling cauldron of sin. And sometimes you get so hopeless in the face of what just seems to be, you know, this 24-hour news cycle of negativity and anti-Catholicism. And, you know, it seems like our faith is coming apart at the seams at times. Well, this is one of the reasons why prayer is so important, because prayer, Pope Benedict talks about how prayer is a school of hope. Why? Because prayer fights against the two sins that undermine our hope, presumption and despair. There's no reason to despair because you're not alone. And when you pray, you know that. You're in relationship with God. It fights against presumption because prayer puts you in the position of a child. You begin to realize more and more, everything is God. And he is in total control. 
but there's an even deeper relationship between prayer and hope. This goes back to what we were talking about last night. Our participation in divinity. Our deification. Remember, God became man so that man might become God, says St. Athanasius. Again, not equal to him, but through participating in his divine life. He shares himself out of love. That's what's laid on the table for us. You know what our problem is? We don't want it badly enough. We're morons. Original sin has made us morons. Right? We don't want the greatest gift that we could ever have. Well, prayer, says St. Augustine, is what changes that. Prayer is, a, is an exercise of desire. It stretches us and it purifies us so that eventually we want God more than anything else. That's why prayer is so important. Our hope is in Him alone. Alone. It's all God. Everything is God. Don't fall into the trap of listening to the, the people talking about all the, the bad things in the church either and how, you know, I mean, turn off YouTube. I mean, seriously. So many people are out there hammering our faith. Even people inside the church are hammering our faith. Do you think God doesn't know what's going on in the Catholic Church? I mean, really. Do you think he doesn't know? Do you think he doesn't know what's happening everywhere at every moment? He knows everything. Our hope lies in him. Prayer is what grows that hope. So we have to do this. we got to stop trying to fill ourselves up with stuff that's never going to satisfy us in this world. You will never be satisfied here. This world is good. It's great. God made it. It's wonderful. Enjoy it. It's not your end. Your end is Almighty God. Right? The more you pray, guys, the happier you're going to be. The more you pray, the more you're going to be restored to the image and likeness of Almighty God. And realize, it's not just about you. When you enter into a life of prayer, it affects your relationships with other people. You want to be a better father and husband? Pray. Want to be a better wife or mother? Pray. Want to be a better son or daughter? Pray. Want to be a better priest or nun? Pray. You want to go to heaven? Pray. Prayer is what leads to peace. Prayer is what leads to hope. Prayer is what leads to God. And if you hadn't started, now is the time. Right? Now is the time. Why? You can't finish in heaven what you don't begin here. As I said last night, you don't have two lives to live. You got one life to live. Now is the time. You begin this relationship with Almighty God tonight. And if you've already got a life of prayer, wonderful. I know there are prayer warriors in this church tonight. And if you're one of them, time to take it to the next level. You can never get to the bottom of God. He is infinite. Grow in your relationship with him. There is no time for us to be mediocre, guys. The world's going to hell in a handbasket around us faster than you. It's like you blink and things change. We need prayer warriors. That's where the real power is. Develop that life of prayer. And in order to get to know the Lord, right, you've got to spend time with him. And at the end of the day, is there anything that's more important than that? So let's pray, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you give us a hotline to you. You're always waiting for us when we want to talk to you. Teach us to do it well. Teach us to do it often. Teach us how to be like you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. You're so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. Same drill as last night. Don't be embarrassed by questions you have. Who's got a question about prayer? Somebody. All right. While you're thinking, okay, good. Got one. Yeah. You know, I was in Ireland right after I became Catholic, and uh, I remember I was in Galway City, and there was a, a lady praying a rosary behind me, and it was English, right? But she was going so fast, I needed subtitles to know where she was in the rosary. And I realized there's a history there, too. But you're right. I mean, the only way 
I have, to, I have to tell myself, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I'm a fast talker. My grandmother used to say, slow down, Matthew, I can't understand you. So I have to always tell myself to slow down, and it takes practice. It does. You have to practice becoming slow. And when you read through scripture, like, I'm, I'm constantly like, because I'm looking for stuff to pull out. And the Lord's like, no, 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 slow down. It, it's just a matter of practice, really. Uh, you know, on the, on the other hand, there's some people who, like, they'll pray their rosaries, and you're like, dude, it's called a decade because there's 10 beads, right? Not because that's how long it takes to get through these 10 beads. So you don't want to go slow, slow, so slow, you're annoying people, right? But when your personal prayer life, it really is about quality. You have to slow down. You can't pull, you can't pull the gold out of there if you're just whipping through this stuff. Realize sacred scripture is the word of God. There's a reason why we have the liturgy of the word before the liturgy of the Eucharist. This is what tills the soil of our heart so that we're prepared to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Almighty God. And, and the Gospels, I mean, if you're looking for something to meditate on, go to the Gospels. The words of Jesus Christ. The goals become like him. Why not use the words of Christ? I'm not saying you can't use other stuff. You can, but man, the Gospels are it, guys. Those are the words literally of God. And while I'm thinking about it, let me just make a comment about the ripple effect of recollection that I, I mentioned earlier. This one was an eye-opener for me. When we talk about the fact that we're trying to quiet our interior lives down, St. Teresa of Avila is really hardcore about this, and you'll see why in a second. When you enter into, she, she will say that if you are doing something in your life that is keeping you from praying effectively, that it's a venial sin. And let me give you an example of this. Let's say you discover some new series on Netflix that you fall in love with and you spend you know, six hours binging on it one night. And the next day you go into your prayer time and you're faithful about it, but you go into your prayer time and you can't get that show out of your head. You're thinking about that show, and you're thinking about your show. You cannot put yourself in the moment and recollect. And your prayer time is over, and you're like, oh, and you move on about your day. That night, you go back, and you binge again. Can't pray the next day. Can't get that show out of your head. Because remember, whatever you put in, this is what's bouncing around in there, right? St. Teresa of Avila says, at this point, you've just now committed venial sin. Why? Because you're making an act of the will to choose to do something that you know is going to impede you in prayer. So when St. Paul talks about praying constantly, and you enter into this state of prayer, well, you begin to realize as you mature in your life of prayer that everything you do in your life is going to have an impact, negatively or positively, on that time of prayer when you enter into conversation with God. Now, it doesn't mean you can't ever watch a movie. It doesn't, matter. it doesn't mean you can't do this, you can't do that. But what it does is put your life in a completely different focus. Because everything we do is ordered to God at the end of the day. Is there anything that's outside of that relationship? Is there anything that should be outside of that relationship? You know, it starts with you're going to the Adoration Chapel and you turn the radio off, right? Maybe I shouldn't listen to Van Halen on my way to Adoration. And I'll start quieting down now. And then you realize, man, maybe I need to quiet down other parts of my life as well. That's why it's the ripple effect. The more you mature, the more that kind of ripples out into all the different aspects of your life because you realize more and more, this time with God is what fuels everything in my life. And I never want to be out of communion with him. And so you begin to choose things in your life based on that relationship, and that prayer time. Does that make sense? I know it sounds a little harsh, but it makes sense when you think about it. We're choosing something other than God. And why would we do that if we're knuckleheads? Right? These things never satisfy us. They don't. We, we turn away from Almighty God, the God who gave himself for us for desperate housewives? I mean, seriously. I mean, give me a break. We're idiots. Right? We, we take this little satisfaction in the moment, and that satisfaction is here and gone. The new car smell always goes away. Nothing is going to satisfy you in this life. Only God. All right, any more questions? Yes, sir. Two nights in a row. How do you know if God's talking to you? It's a great question. How do you know God's talking to you? 
You grow in relationship with him. You know, let me use the other side of that as kind of an example. You start to recognize God's voice, number one, if it's in line with what the Catholic Church teaches. Right? So if you think God's telling you to do something that's not in line with what the church teaches, then you know that's not God. Like those dudes that go streaking across the football field at the 50-yard line, they're like, they paint their body blue, and they run across her. No, Mary told me to do this. I'm doing it for her, Our Lady. No, no one told you to do that, right? You're making this idiocy up in your head. If you think you have some kind of weird thought that God's telling you to do, the number one thing you do is you go to Father or you go to some holy person you know and bounce it off of them so they can tell you you're crazy, okay? But everything has to fit into the Catholic life. That's the number one way. But the more you grow in relationship to God, you're going to know that the things that he's saying to you are legit because they're really ordered to your relationship with him. Generally, he's not telling you to go do this or that other wild thing. He's saying, come to me. Now, he might start to put that tug on your heart to become a priest, or he might put that tug on your heart to become a nun. And it's a discernment process. This is one of the reasons why St. Ignatius of Loyola has his spiritual exercises. This is how you discern the will of the Lord. You go through that. This is why he gave it to us. So it's a process of growing in relationship with him and knowing his voice and recognizing it, doing what's making sure it's within the, the teachings of the Catholic Church, and then you spend time discerning it using your parents or other people that you know are spiritually mature. And that's how you start to recognize the Lord's voice. It's a great question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any suggestions for guiding young children with Yeah, no, it's a, this, is a, this is a big one. The number one thing in order to get your children to begin to enter into this is A, you have to do it. Okay? They need to see you doing this. I will never forget this. I came home one day from work and I found one of these little sheets on the ground. I I get up, as I said, before dawn and that's my prayer time. And every now and then one of my kids will come in early and they see me or whatever. And I found this sheet that my six-year-old at the time daughter had written. It was one of these fill-in-the-blank things from school. It said, my hero is my, and she wrote, my dad because he prays. Like my six-year-old had just seen the fact that I have a prayer life. And that was the example. I wasn't trying to do this, but she knows, right? And so that's number one. You've got to to model this for your kids. And then you begin to enter them into it by practice, right? So this would start with vocal prayer. You start there with kids because they need to learn how to talk to God, say your family rosary, but also teach them how to pray extemporaneously to the Lord, right? Because if you can't talk out loud to God, it's going to be a little difficult to talk interiorly. So you teach them to pray and to have a conversation with God just like they would have a conversation with a friend. And then you start with small chunks of time. And I always think that for kids, lots of times, um, we will do a story. uh, Or if we're in the middle of a, a decade of the rosary, we'll get to a point and I'll say, I'll give them a little background of the mystery and just let's think about this, right? But you, all you're really trying to do is to get them to have some moments of silence to think about what it is that they are engaging in prayer. And that's how you teach them to begin to enter into meditative prayer and encourage them to do this. Buy them a Bible, right? And teach them to read scripture. And just because Lexio Divina, reading and praying over sacred scripture, is one of the most powerful ways of meditating. You teach them to read slowly through the Bible and let the words on the page speak to them. But take it small chunks. Don't try and overwhelm them or beat them up over the side of the head. I got a little active at some points. I'm like, I'm trying to get them to do this. And my kids are like, come on, man, you know. So we don't want to beat them over the head with it. But we have to model it for them and get them to love it. Get them to see the value of it. I mean, children, I think we underestimate them way too much. Jesus said, become, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, Right? They can enter into the relationship with Jesus in lots of times in a more powerful way than we can. We're kind of far removed. They have less baggage than we do. Don't underestimate the power of children's prayers. We just have to give them the opportunity to do it. Anybody else? Come on now. Yes, sir.
That's a great question. It, the question was, for those of you who couldn't hear, since I'm a Protestant convert, what did I bring in from my prayer life as a Catholic, I mean as a Protestant, that kind of enriched my Catholic prayer life? Is that what you're asking? Okay. I'll go back to sacred scripture. So, like Lexio Divina, Lexio Divina is re- reading and praying over sacred scripture. I did that as a Protestant, okay? But that's as far as I could take it. But the, but, and, and what I, why I say that is, as Catholics, we do Lexio Divina in Mass. We're reading and praying over sacred scripture in the liturgy of the word, but it doesn't stop there. We then get to receive that word in the Eucharist. I never had that opportunity, right? So Catholicism took my prayer life and put it on steroids because of that. I receive Jesus, the same word that I'm studying, I receive him. Okay, the word made flesh enters into me, right? The benefit that I had in the way that I was raised is that because as a Protestant, everything is focused on sacred scripture, that's your only authority, like if there's one thing that was pounded into my head, it's the Bible alone that is the only authority because only it is the inspired and errant word of God, right? I still believe it's the inspired word of God. Why? Because the Catholic Church told me so. You know why? Because it's our book. If there were no Catholic Church, there would be no Bible. It came into being because of two Catholic synods. I did not know that as a Protestant. I literally thought it kind of dropped out of the sky and landed in the pew in front of me. I had no idea where the Bible came from. It comes from the church. No church, no Bible. But the benefit that I received was, because we focused on it so much, I knew the stories. And once you start praying over the Bible, you quickly realize that it's uh, connecting the dots. Because the Bible's one long story, guys. It's the story of our family. We talk about entering into the family of God. That's all the Bible is. It's one long genealogy of us getting kicked out of the family and God bringing us back into the family with Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and all those covenants in sacred scripture. But because I knew the stories, now I could enter more deeply into the prayer. And so all those puzzle pieces that I had as a, as a Protestant came together to form this beautiful mosaic in Catholicism because I understood what it was all ordered to. Catholicism gave me a framework to understand all those disparate stories that I knew from sacred scripture. And this is what is important for us as Catholics. The Bible is our book. So if you think that Moses is the guy who built the ark, you need to go back and read the stories again. We have to learn the stories because it's our story. In fact, it's a story that's still being written in our lives. The Bible's not over and done with. It's still being written in our lives. It's the story that concludes in each one of our lives. It's our story. It's our family heritage. So we need to learn it. And that will greatly enhance your prayer over sacred scripture. And you know what's interesting is Guido the Carthusian, who's the guy who really kind of made Lexio Divina popular. He, you know, Guido the Carthusian sounds like, you know, Italian muscle out of Chicago. But he was a monk who wrote the Ladder of, of Ascent. And he, uh, not the Ladder of Ascent. Uh, I'm having mean, a 53-year-old moment. I'm forgetting the book title. But he wrote the classic work on, on Lexio Divina. And he talks about how it ends in contemplation. You know, we're talking about contemplation as the highest form of prayer. That's what Lexio Divina ends in. But you can't make that happen, right? God does it to you. So the end of sacred scripture is God filling himself up into you. That's what the Bible's for. It's not just some book that's sitting there, you get dusted off because Father's coming over for dinner and we want to put it on the coffee table. We need to learn it, guys. It's our story. It's the story of how it is that we're saved. So that's the biggest takeaway that I brought in. Uh, but, but Catholicism took my prayer life and took it in a completely different upward trajectory than what I had. I look back now, and this isn't meant to be an insult to, to Protestants, but I look back and it was so thin what I had. What we pray about literally becomes a reality in our lives as we receive the Eucharist. That's why it's a one-two punch. If you come to daily Mass and you don't have a life of prayer, so What? You're putting up all kinds of blocks and you're not getting the grace that God is offering. Again, there's enough grace there to save you, to save the whole world. We stop it. Prayer gets us out of the way. It like smooths the the shoot so that grace can come in fast and furious and change our lives. Maybe one more question from somebody. Yes, sir.
right. That's right. It's a great point. And so what he's saying is that even if you pray for something, even something good, the answer might not happen right then. The answer might not be what you want, even. This is something that a lot of us experience. Like if you have a loved one who's going through an illness or you're going through an illness. When my mom was dying of cancer, I prayed a million times that she'd be healed. Right? And in God's perfect will, it was her time to go. Right? And I had to come to that acceptance. And this is where trustful surrender to divine providence comes into play. We have to, if we really believe that God is our Father, that He is our perfect and loving Father above, then we have to put ourselves into His hands. Yes, you pray. In fact, the Lord talks about rewarding perseverance in prayer. Do it. Pray. Right? But also realize that at the end of the day, whatever it is that happens, it, it's yes, no, not yet. Those are the three answers you're going to get. Right? Regardless of what the answer is, take solace that the Lord is going to do whatever it is that is best for your eternity. He wants you to be happy in the here and now, for sure. Right? But like any good parent, he's most concerned about your future. He wants you in heaven with him. And he's going to write straight with all the crooked lines of our lives and all of our prayers, and all the grace that's generated, and there is a, it's a mystery, right? How does our prayer as human beings affect God's, you know, how does that generate grace? How does that all work? There's a mystery there, for sure, right? But at the end of the day, trust that God is your Father. Whatever it is that happens to you, that He is always working for your well-being. For we know that in all things, God works, right, for the good of those who love Him who are called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28, right? God is always at work for your good. That's what we always fall back on, no matter what happens in life. Why? Because you're his child. You're adjoined to his family. You're being divinized. You're made for relationship with him. He wants you in his family more than you want to be in his family. So he's constantly working in your life to get you there. That's why you trust. You give it all over to him and allow him to give himself to you. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, again, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here. Move in our lives. Help us to grow in prayer so that we can be part of the family of God in heaven. Join our loved ones and drag as many people kicking and screaming as we can into this family as well. Help us to be evangelizers, to spread your truth, beauty, and goodness to the entire world. In your precious and holy name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much for having me here in Oregon. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. I've got one more talk with the men's group tomorrow, and then I'm heading off to go back to Ohio and try and get up early to pray uh, when I'm going to be exhausted with the time change. But I'm really happy to have spent this time with you. I hope it was beneficial for you. It's beneficial for me to be with members of the body of Christ who love Jesus. Let's love Jesus more tomorrow than we do today and more the next day after that than we do tomorrow. Amen? Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, Matthew, on behalf of Father Luan and Immaculate Conception Parish, we uh, just really appreciate your spending the last two nights with us and, and sharing your, your deep thoughts. I can't help but think that everyone here will bring something away from what you've shared that we can, we can uh, contemplate and apply in our lives. So we are really appreciative of your being here. Thank you all for coming the last couple nights. And uh, make sure as you leave to uh, each family, grab one of his books and uh, continue to read on prayer. So thank you all and have a safe trip home.